If you somehow haven't already heard, Zillow dropped some absolutely shocking news this past week. They are closing down their iBuying program known as Zillow Offers. Now, this doesn't come as a complete surprise actually because Zillow had announced the program was struggling and they were pausing new acquisitions just a few weeks ago. But I was pretty shocked, honestly, that Zillow threw in the towel as early as they did. Well, that was until I read some of the figures they disclosed, and it appears they lost over $440 million in Q3 alone, and their total losses from Zillow offers amounted to over $1 billion. So I guess, yeah, after learning those things, I can see why they're shutting it down. I've also been reading, as I'm sure you have too, stories about Zillow buying properties that have been sitting on the markets for weeks, which is pretty rare in today's housing market, and then buying these properties that are sitting there for 15% over asking price, only to then go and sell the property for less than they paid. So what exactly happened here? What went so wrong with Zillow offers? Today, we're going to dive into this important question and I'm going to bring in some big guns to help me break down this story. See, I've been a real estate investor for 11, almost 12 years actually, but I have never actually flipped a house. I am a rental property investor through and through. But luckily, our friend Ken Corsini, star of HGTV's Flip or Flop Atlanta, is going to join us today so we can learn firsthand from one of the best house flippers in the business what exactly happened with Zillow offers and what real estate investors like you and me can learn from their failure. Hey everyone, this is Dave Meyer from Bigger Pockets, and today we have an awesome guest and an incredible show for you. So I want to get right into this thing, but first I do have to remind everyone to please subscribe to the Bigger Pockets YouTube channel, give this video a thumbs up, we really appreciate it. And without any further delay, let's welcome Ken Corsini in to help us break down this important story. All right, Ken Corsini, thank you so much for being here to help us break down this really pretty interesting story. How are you? Good, David. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, of course. So we'll get into this a little bit later. For, but for people who don't already know Ken, he is the star, along with his wife, Anita, of HGTV's Flipper Flop Atlanta and has a new show, Flipping Showdown, that I think premieres in just a week or two, right? November 17th. Mark your calendars. Awesome, man. Well, congratulations. I want to hear all about that. But first... Let's get into this Zillow debacle. What was your first reaction when you heard the news the other day? You know, I gotta be honest, I wasn't 100% surprised. I, I sort of felt like even when all the iBuyers got into the marketplace, but then Zillow, sort of kind of the last one into the mix, you know, when the, when the market is as hot as it is and they're just, you know what you're hearing in terms of them paying over market value, it's like at some point, you know, the music's gonna stop. And it just, it's not that the fundamentals are missing in terms of flipping houses. And, uh, and I think they felt it and, and they, and they exited it. and I wasn't a hundred percent surprised by it. Yeah. I, I'm surprised they threw in the towel as soon as they did, but I'm not surprised that they, as aggressive as they were, that they didn't, yeah. they were going to hit some, some bumps in the road. So I, I was talking to the audience before we pulled you in here that I've never flipped a house. Um, so can you just tell us a little bit about the fundamentals you were just referring to? Like, what are the fundamentals you as an experienced flipper look for? And what are the major ones Zillow missed here? Yeah. You know, so the first thing you learn when you flip a house is that you buy the house, you know, at a certain discount. And it's different for different people. But, you know, let's, let's say 75% of after repaired value. Zillow was buying at market value. So right out of the gates, there was no there was no ability to create margin other than appreciation. So you know, as a flipper, I never bank on appreciation. If I ha if values happen to go up over the six months that I'm flipping a house, it's the cherry on top. But you sh you certainly don't go into a house expecting that. Where they really built their algorithms based on here's what we think home prices are going to do, and so we're okay buying it at market value then putting money into it and then hoping that there's some margin left. And I think what they discovered is they just, they miscalculated. They banked a hundred percent on appreciation. And when the market softened just a little bit, you know, you spread that over 8,000 houses and all of a sudden you're upside down on two thirds of them, I think is what I heard. So two thirds of them right now are being marketed for less than what they paid for them. That's unbelievable. 
It's yeah, yeah. I mean, just in Q3, they lost over $440 million, and their total losses were over a billion dollars. And they've been doing this for, I think, like three years, which is an, a staggering, staggering amount of money. So it sounds like what you're saying is like they basically had two problems. One, they were buying way from way more than they should, but they also were having some operational challenges as well, right? Well, that's the other thing. So in October, I think they came out uh, and and just said, hey, we're stopping. We're not going to buy anymore for a little while. We're going to figure out our operational challenges, which I totally get because part of that's just timing right now. You know, supply issues, material issues. We are we're all feeling it, especially as a home builder. You know, there's a lot of times where we're waiting months for certain things, and so you know, do that on an aggregated scale. You got eight thousand houses. There are labor shortages. I guarantee that they're having a mm-hmm. hard time finding subcontractors to show up to eight thousand houses. And same with material. They're probably waiting for appliances or for windows or who who knows what else. So. Those challenges alone, I mean, even if they were buying right, that would have been a difficult you know, thing to overcome. But then add on top of that the fact that, okay, we bought for too much, and, and it's a disaster. Yeah, I think the, the buying for too much thing is probably not a surprise to anyone who's a real estate investor or a real estate professional. Because, I mean, for years, you just hear people complaining about Zestimates. And I don't know if they use Zestimates to value their eye buying, but yeah, uh, it seems to me like they were just – like over trusting their technology. And I'm, you know, I'm a data guy. I like algorithms. I believe that they have a role to play in real estate investing, but like, would you ever rely on technology and not have like that human element involved in your flipping decisions? No. And that's, that's kind of what makes you wonder to what extent they had analysts like on an individual house by house basis, looking at them and saying, this house makes sense or this house doesn't make sense. And honestly, I'll, I'll just bet that there, there's pressure on, on internally. There's pressure because there's a lot of Wall Street money behind them to buy, buy, buy. Like they made some predictions of how many houses they were going to buy. We're going to buy 5,000 a month eventually. And so there's this pressure to get to that point. And I think they threw a little bit of logic and reason out the window to try to do that would be my guess. Yeah, that, that does. You will never know, but that does seem like a very logical read of what happened. Yeah. So what do you think happens with eye buying from here? Because Zillow is not the only player here. You know, you have OfferPad and Open Door. I think Redfin does some eye buying, right? Like, what do you think, what's going to happen now? That's a good question. I, you know, I did read somewhere that, um, you know, Open Door and OfferPad it started scaling back in terms of what they were offering compared to market value in September, where Zillow didn't. And I think Phoenix is always sort of that good leading indicator market where in Phoenix, I think Zillow doubled down in September. It was like, nope, nope, this is where the market's going. And they were, they were being more aggressive where at least open door and offer pad scaled back a little bit and they were a little bit more conservative. So they weren't necessarily paying over market for it. But it, you know, the other thing is th- those other two companies were created for the purpose of acquiring houses where Zillow really was always more of a data company, you know, and, and got into this space. So you got to wonder if operationally maybe open door and offer pad are set up a little bit better for eye buying. Um, but to your to your question, it really hinges on this market, right? As long as values keep going up, eye buying is probably going to make sense. But the second the the prices really cool down, or maybe even retreat just a little bit, they're going to be upside down on a whole slew of inventory. And so, hmm. do they get out of the market at that point? Do they hit pause for a while? I don't. I never thought that this business model was fully sustainable long term. I thought it was for a period of time, and um, I could be wrong, but. We'll see what the values do. I mean, the good news for the iBuyers is I don't think anybody's anticipating, you know, some big market correction right now. Interest rates are still low, right? And there's in, in, inventory is very low. Demand is very high. So we're in a market where iBuying could potentially continue to work for a little while. But at some point, the music stops and, 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 the, and the market softens. And we'll, we'll see what happens to iBuyers when that happens. Yeah, because it always seems to me that flipping is a great idea, but if you're holding a lot of inventory or you're in the middle of a bunch of projects when there's a market correction, that's when you're at the greatest risk. So I'm curious, you know, given where prices have gone over the last year or two, what are you doing? Do you still think now is a good time to be investing? And and what is your strategy right now? That's a good question. So, you know, the show for us opened up a lot of opportunities to do a lot of different things. So we, we flipped for a long time. We still flip a little bit, not, not quite as much as we used to. Obviously, we filmed a new show this year. We're big in new construction right now. I feel like 
there's a huge shortage of new houses. And so for us, that's been a really good pivot where we build a lot of new construction houses. Um, we've actually kind of pivoted to, to support investors. So we, we've, we've started a hard money lending business because there's, a, there's still a lot of opportunities around the country to, to flip houses, to buy and hold houses. Some markets are trickier than others. You know, Atlanta, where I am, it's obviously, it's a very competitive market. The iBuyers are here. So it's, it's trickier to find good inventory to flip. There's still good buy and hold inventory, but you go to some of the other um, secondary markets and flippers are still having a heyday. There's still lots of opportunity there. And so we've sort of pivoted to support guys in that space where we do a lot of, of, lot of lending. The other cool thing too, we'll talk about this in a minute, is, our, is our, um, our new show. The whole premise of our show is that it's a competition show and the winners of the show get $100,000 and they also get a Red Barn franchise. And oh, so for cool. us, we're like, you know what? We've been in the space. We flipped a thousand houses. This is a really good opportunity for us to support people that want to be in the flipping business. And so we're actually launching a franchise for, for flippers. So we've really sort of pivoted our attention to how do we build this out and support people who want to be in the flipping space. Wow, so, that is so cool. Yeah, there's, no, that, that's I mean, amazing. I've never heard of that. Is, are there other flipping franchises out there? Well, the big one is, uh, is Homevestors. Right. You've probably heard okay. of them, the little, the little caveman that says we buy ugly yeah. houses. You know, they're out there. And they've been doing it for years. Yeah, that's the thing, too. I, I've been at this since 2005. So I've seen a lot of market cycles, and I've never stopped flipping houses. So it just goes to show you that regardless of the market cycle that you're in, there's an angle to make money in real estate. And so you know, part of, part of what we want to do is help people that want to be real estate investors understand that and then thrive regardless of market cycle. Wow, that's awesome. I I am still like reeling from the fact that you have flipped 1000 houses. That's in 15, <laughs> well, I'm old, man. In 15 years. <laughs> I've been around for a while. Yeah. Yeah. We flipped wow, a lot of that houses. Is, that is truly impressive. So, uh, before we get it, I, I want to talk a little bit more about the show, but before we do, you know, if, if you're a new investor, maybe you're, you're on your first or second flip, not your thousandth, what would your advice to investors be right now? Given everything that's going on in the market, you're hearing about competition from iBuyers. It is a, the, the market is, I think, still strong personally, but it's, it's just a changing landscape. There's a lot to keep up with for house flippers. What would your advice be? Yeah. Specifically for somebody that just wants to flip. Just buy, fix, and sell. You know, you got to be really smart about the areas that you target. So, you know, some of your big metropolitan areas where there's a lot of competition from my buyers, it's going to be tougher. It just is. You're competing against people that are paying market value. So, um, you know, pick and choose the market you want to be in. If you're if you're if you're going to be in the big major metros with a lot of competition, then you have to be scrappier. You have to find those those trickier lists to get a hold of. You have to go. Be really targeted in your marketing and then be really aggressive in your marketing. Because, again, you have to be able to buy at a discount. This business does not work if you're trying to play close to market, pay close to market value. Unless uh, – there's a caveat to that. This is an interesting market, too, where I see a lot of guys who are flipping to hedge funds, basically hmm. wholesaling to hedge funds, where you can get a, you know, get a house locked up for 95% of value and turn around and flip it to a hedge fund for 100% or even 105% of market value. And there's guys that have built entire business models around that right now. So, you know, if you're, if you're open to being a wholesaler or just, you know, finding deals and then assigning them to the guys that are willing to pay too much for houses, there's a whole business around that right now. It's one of those, if you can't beat them, join them. Like, all right, we're going to pay too much. Let's, let's do this together. Um, right on. Yeah. Again, I, I've heard, I've heard of that a lot right now that people are selling entire portfolios or, you know, almost working exclusively for basically becoming an employee of a hedge fund or some of these other institutional investors. Cause you know, like you said about Zillow, they are incentivized just to spend money. They are not yeah. looking at a return over six months or 12 months. They're looking over a seven, 10 year return cycle. And they clearly believe in the long-term prospects of the housing market and they'll pay whatever they got just to deploy capital right now. And there's a lot of hungry capital that's in the United States and they're okay with two to three percent. They're they're fine with that. So you can buy a house for three hundred thousand dollars and get fifteen hundred in rent. Which I mean, you know, as a as a traditional buy and rent investor, we would never buy at those numbers, right? But there's hedge funds that are perfectly fine making two and three percent of their money. So 
Where Zillow, and, and I, I, to that point, I think Zillow, what I'm hearing too, is they're actually shopping their inventory right now to some of those larger buy and hold institutional investors. And honestly, they may get out of this and not really lose their shirt because somebody's willing to buy this whole inventory just to sit on it and rent it. Who knows? Totally. When I, when I first heard this news, I was like, let me get one of those properties. They're just selling stuff that they just fixed right. up and they're selling it for under market. I was like, how do I get one? And then I was right. reading something that said they're trying to sell it as a portfolio. They're not trying to go sell individual properties. And they're probably trying to put this in the past as quickly as they possibly can. Well, and they'll probably find, again, somebody else willing to pay too much for these properties because they've got hungry capital. Where you know yeah. you and I would want to get them at a discount. Well, you know, big another big institutional investor might be fine overpaying for them and just sitting on them for the next five years. Yeah, man, it's like the the greater fool theory, right? Like as long as there's a greater fool who will buy something from you, right. and you it might work out for you. Right. Right. Uh, all right, cool. So tell us a little bit about this show. I mean, you told me a little bit while we were warming up. It sounds awesome, but fill everyone else in. Yeah. So it's uh, it's a show we filmed earlier this year, which we're really excited about obviously very different from what we filmed before which is flipper flop atlanta this is uh it's called flipping showdown and the whole premise of the show is that we had uh three different teams move to atlanta and each of those teams were competing against each other and so each of the teams got to flip three houses so it was a total of nine houses flipped in the season and basically it was sort of like a big tryout to win a red barn franchise so the winner actually gets a hundred thousand dollars which is the largest uh cash prize that HGTV's ever given out, which is pretty exciting. Damn. And then uh, and then a Red Barn franchise, which we're super excited about when launching this franchise business. And the winner of the show will be the very first franchisee. And uh, and so they competed, you know, who, who flipped the best, who managed their teams the best, who did the best designs. There's all these different criteria that went into who was the best flipper. And I, I will tell you this, there is a lot, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of drama. There's a lot of ups, a lot of downs. And uh, it was just a really fun season to film. Awesome, man. That sounds great. So where can people check it out? HGTV on November 17th. I think it airs at 9 p.m. So set your, set your DVRs if you can't stay up that late. But HGTV on November 17th. Awesome, man. I'll definitely check it out. Well, congratulations to you and Anita. And thank you, as always, for being such a good friend of Bigger Pockets. We appreciate your time and helping us break down this Zillow disaster that's been unfolding over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, no, I appreciate you having me on. It's been a fun conversation. All right. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Uh, for Bigger Pockets, I'm Dave Meyer, and he's Ken Corsini, and we'll see you all next week. <laughs>